Welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Bundles and today's video is going to be a marketing video. I have been doing a marketing series on this channel. So for those of you business owners out there, I know this video will be encouraging to you um, as well as the other videos that I've created before. Um, I do. I will go ahead and list my previous marketing videos under this video. I'm going to ask that you subscribe to the channel and also that you give the video a big thumbs up. I wasn't really too big on giving the video a thumbs up in the past just because I didn't know that it helped boost the algorithm and push the video out there. Now that I know there's really a, a reason to it, um, it's it's really beneficial for me and the channel's growth for you to go ahead and you know hit the thumbs up button and also subscribe. If you wanna see some different types of videos, more of DIY, more vlogs, more fun type of get to know me videos, go over to my second channel at Brittany's Place, subscribe there. Once we hit 100 subscribers, I will be doing a giveaway on both channels. So today we're gonna be talking about some other um, ways that you can use psychology and marketing and other ways that psychology is actually used effectively in marketing i'm in school for psychology um just completed my my course i got a b overall i'm really excited about it i do start my internship on uh tuesday so i'm going to hopefully be vlogging that experience too and then having that on this channel for those of you that want to see but learning about psychology has really helped me look at everything differently including business i've been in business since 2013 i enjoy learning new practices and and coming to you all with new business structures and models and systems and tools. And this is no different. The fact that I'm learning so much about psychology, um, again, it helps me just look at everything differently. My perspective on business and, and uh, uh, as a whole has broadened. So I want to share that with you all. Today, I'm going to be looking at my phone. I do have my notes right in front of me. So if you see me looking off of uh, to this way, it's because I'm looking at my notes. And this video is inspired by an article that I was reading on Smart Insights. Um, I will have the link included in my email mailing list. So if you're not enrolled in my email mailing list, please go to keepingupwithbrittany.com and enroll. That way you'll get this link as well as some other business information that I send out very frequently. So I'm going to be sharing what they list. And I'm also going to be sharing my thoughts about it and also my experience uh, so be sure to again give the video a big thumbs up make sure that you are subscribed and let's get right into this video so the first point is relate to your customer we all know that relating to our customers are you know it's really important I've talked about that in some other videos but I want to talk about a study that is outlined in this article so it says Goldstein uh, Sildani and Graviscus 2008 and I'm hoping I'm not butchering the name if I am I apologize conducted a study on using social norms to motivate environmental uh, conversations in hotels. In particular, they tried to determine what kind of message would get hotel guests to reuse their towels. They used three variations. So they used a standard message to help save the environment. They also used 75% um, of hotel guests in this room, in this hotel reuse their towels. And then they also had 75% of hotel guests in this room reuse their towels. Okay, so though I was reading like, what's the difference? So the first one, if you didn't catch that, it says 75% of hotel guests in this hotel use their towels. The third one was 75% of hotel guests in this room reuse their towels. So the messages that relate to the persist participant, other guests reuse towels, increase participants reusing them by 10 to 15%. So how does this apply to marketing? Uh, the phenomenon where people tend to view others who are similar to them more favorably is called in-group favoritism. All in all, the best way to motivate your customers to do something is to say that customers in their situation have done so. So try to find common ground and draw similarities among your customers, as well as between your company and your customers is what they list. I wholeheartedly agree. So learning in psychology, you know, everything really stems from how we think, how we relate, how we perceive information, how we process information, how we store information. The human mind is so amazing. And sometimes we do things without even recognizing that we do things. And we really stop our business from, uh, reaching the maximum growth because we're thinking inside of this box that not everyone is thinking inside of. And then sometimes we're halting our growth because we're not thinking inside of a general, I would say box too, where a lot of people or most people think based on studies. One thing that I learned about social media is a lot of times social media will come to us with information, even business tips based on feeling or based on one person's experience, but not really based on a, a study that's conducted. And that was something that I learned when I got into psychology that a lot of the information that I had received based on psychology and how people think was based on really just a few people's experiences and not really studies 
done to or done in the general public. Now, not saying that studies can't change or studies are 100 percent proof, but I am saying that it, it, it matters where you get your information. And it matters uh, how many people you're looking at when you're looking at taking into taking a practice into consideration and implementing a practice in your business. Um, because just going off of one person's experience, that's great. I, I'm, I'm happy to learn more about it. But that doesn't really give us a broad view on you know, multiple people, right? In multiple areas. And when I learned about how scientists conduct their studies, how the participants are chosen, um, it helped me have a better understanding and a better appreciation for actual experiments. So I love the fact that they actually conducted an experiment. And then the experiment, they talk about how they try different they try different outcomes and just having a message help the environment didn't it didn't win it didn't get most people in that study to um reuse their towels but explaining to them that hey most people that were in this this room that you're in reuse their towels it ignited something in them and a lot of people to go ahead and want to reuse and so often in business and in life period we want to be we want to follow after the crowd. You know, sometimes we say we don't, but really we do. You know, we, we do follow after trends. That's how trends get started. We do follow um, after what's popular. So taking that concept and that study and trying to think about how we can implement it in our business. So for me, I do sell hair extensions, amongst some other things. Um, and if we just use my hair business for an example, if I am able to put inside of my marketing campaigns and my newsletters, um, what my most popular texture is and also how many people are buying this product that will encourage more to buy and I have personalized experience that that works because I've tried it I've tried to put in my different email marketing campaigns that my Mongolian deep wave bundles um, if you don't know about hair extensions then just try to follow me but it's a type of hair extension that I offer and I put in there that those are my, that's my favorite hair texture. And most people continue to buy that texture. Now, I didn't really think it, think of it in a scientific way like we just read over, but that's a clear example of people wanting to do what others have done in their situation. Um, so also taking that further, you know, if you have a brick and mortar location, considering having signs in your location that frame or that show what most people are buying or what what's popular at this time and then also trying different catchphrases and different ways to get people's attention to alert them of what most people are doing in their situation um, even if you're wanting people to maybe use more of your buy now pay later options than their credit cards because really when you use buy now pay later options it's safer for a lot of e-commerce e-commerce businesses because for example i'm using klarna and when a customer disputes a, a order that they have through my website or that they place with me, um, but they bought or purchased through Klarna, um, Klarna isn't quick to go ahead and just grab the money out like a lot of credit card merchants are. Um, you don't have to do as much fighting on your end to prove that the order is legitimate. The customer has to do more of the, the fighting. And even still at that point, a lot of times they'll direct the customer back to the initial merchant, which is you. Whereas different credit card companies, they're not gonna do all of that. They're gonna be on the customer side and they're going to take a lot of them, the money right out of your account. And then you have to prove that the order is legitimate. And even if it is legitimate and you prove everything that you need to prove, there's still a chance that they still may side in the customer's favor because it's their customer and they can. So just considering different um, goals that your business has and figuring out different ways that you can promote that goal to be achieved. So if you're wanting to have more of a certain shirt sold, let's say you're wanting to sell more red shirts than blue shirts, how can I do that? By letting people know that more people are purchasing red shirts. How can I do that? So figuring out different creative ways, maybe sending out emails, going over what your most popular shirt is, and just explaining the benefits is not enough because if we go back to the study again where the message said help save the environment, that wasn't enough. That's a benefit, a huge benefit. If you if you ask me or anyone else, I'm sure they would say that's a huge benefit, right? But that's not enough in this study and in a lot of cases to get people to actually move toward what you're wanting them to do in business. When you think about it, a lot of us are just, we're, we're programmed, right? And so different businesses and schools and jobs, I mean, just people, period, understand that we have a sense of programming to us. And sometimes, again, we do what we're 
prompted to do versus what we're told to do. And so just saying, hey, buy these products or hey, support my business is not going to be enough in most cases to bring forth the results that you're wanting to see in your business. So I think that's really cool to um, keep in mind. The next part that I'm going to go over, and I'm going to break this video up into, I think, two parts. So I'm not going to go over everything in this video. I'm just going to touch on some really good points, and then I'll pick back up in the second video. Um, so the second part that they list is start small. So this is commonly known as the foot in the door technique, Friedman and Frazier 1966. I love how they are including the studies um, because that's where you get the real facts, the real information. Um, so knocked on doors asking if residents could do something small, such as sign a petition or put a sticker on their window. For their control group, they skipped some houses and didn't speak to them all. Sometime later, Friedman and Frazier went to the exact same houses with a larger request, such as putting a large sign on their lawn, which was either related to the same issue as the previous request or related to a different issue. They found that people whom they had already approached were much more willing to agree to their large request, nearly three times more willing if, they, if their request pertained to a different issue and more than four times more willing if the request pertained to the same issue. So how does this apply to marketing? Starting small and then gradually scaling up your request is one way to convince your customers to do something. We see examples of this everywhere. First, a nonprofit organization simply asks for your email address. Next, they keep you updated regarding their events and progress. Before you know it, they're asking you to donate. The opposite of the foot and door technique is the door and the face technique, where instead of starting small, you start big. You make a large request from the get-go, maybe something ridiculous that the customer unsurprisingly uh, turns down. Then you uh, make a smaller request. In this case, the customer is more likely to agree to your smaller request as it's much less ridiculous than the larger request you started off with. So I have used the second method. I, I guess I've used both methods, but the second method is the one that stands out to me most where I've started, um, I've started off with my, I guess you could say ridiculous offer or my most, you know, my larger offer. And then I've tried to scale down. That's uh, what we were taught when I first got into sales. I've been in sales my entire career, even before I started my own business. My first job was in sales. Um, and I, the first time I got hired into my first job or my first, I consider real job. Um, I'll go into that in another video, but I had to do, I had to actually sell the managers a pen before I could get into the sales position. And um, I was excited. I was shocked that I got picked because I'm like, ah, you know, I'm the youngest person here and I did get picked and I, I you know, I, I, I enjoyed working there, you know, I just, for as long as I did enjoy it. And then I decided, you know, hey, this really isn't as enjoyable as I thought. I want more freedom. And so I started my own business. I have a video going over that, but to not get sidetracked. Um, so we were taught to start with the, the offer. So when people would come in, they would call in and they would want to, I don't know, have a question about their bill and they would want to get that resolved. So once I resolved that question and even kind of before I resolved it, I would be looking at in their account to see what they didn't have and what I could offer. I would already have the questions, the open-ended questions that I was going to ask them. And I really just kind of tailored the call to um, complete what they initially called in for, plus to also upsell. So um, I wanted to make my commission. I wanted to help them out and I wanted to advance my career with the company. So I created like my own little type of call flow in order to achieve that. And what I found is that when I offered a big product, like say they had internet and cell phone on their account, no TV, when I would offer TV, which was one of our larger products, excuse me, sorry, something's in my eye. Some customers would off the bat say no. And we were also trained that, you know, customers are um, apt to say no to things that they may still want. And so we were um, taught in training that sometimes people would say up to no three times um, before they would even consider what you're offering. And so um, just really figuring out different ways to ask the question, keeping the conversation going and not making them upset was, was really our goal. And so during one call, someone called in, they had internet and cell phone. I was able to offer them TV. And they were like, we don't want TV. Are you serious? You're going to add another expense when I'm calling about my bill. I'm trying to reduce my expenses and you want to add TV on the account. And um, so I asked them open-ended questions, just figuring out what they were doing for TV. If they were actually watching TV, did they have TV with another provider? If I could save the money because I knew money was a, an issue for them. But I also wanted to sell on the value um, because people tend to buy things that they want, whether it's expensive or not. Sometimes you see people that may not, um, or you may know people personally that may not really have uh, financial stability. But if they their birthday comes around or Christmas comes around and they really want even a luxury bag, for an example, um, you may see that same person spending their last getting a luxury bag and you're like, 
what? Why would you spend that much on the bag when you know you were just struggling for the last few months? But people do it all the time. People spend their last money, their last dollar. I've worked in different institutions and different companies where people would not pay their car note to, to literally go and buy a new outfit. And they, they would say it, you know, we, part of my job uh, would be skip tracing. So we would have to pull up their social media accounts and figure out like where where the, the the vehicle the collateral that we had was at and all this different stuff and we we would see okay wow like people would put on social media everything that they did they would literally put every move even if they bought some new items so people would buy luxury items before they would even pay their bills and so um that just showed me that that went to to, to tell me that people when they say they don't have the money sometimes it's, it's it's a legitimate you know hey i don't have the money but really that doesn't stop a lot of people from purchasing people not having the money will still end up buying what they want um and a lot of times people that that i don't want to you know I, I don't want the comments to go like oh only irresponsible people. i'm just saying let's just say people in general some people do that so um when they said no to tv i knew that okay just because they said no to tv the call wasn't over i still had other things that i could offer that could provide value and still not increase the rate as high as the tv and so then i would go ahead and offer a higher internet plan that's still getting something right and that's what a five dollar increase and then i would offer maybe another cell phone that would be free for a couple months and then it would charge some additional fifteen dollars so i would just offer the other products that we had so that is something that companies use very frequently i also use that with my hair business um and then you know the first method that they went over uh where you offer something small i do that too by asking for email addresses um and then after that you you do want to keep your email subscribers engaged by sharing valuable information um, by also keeping them updated with different discounts and perks and letting them know that them subscribing does give them a higher rank with your business they are going to be able to have some type of incentive over people that don't subscribe and then um, being able to ask for different sales and ask for donations. And I tell a lot of people that I do do business mentoring with how important it is to get an email address because it is super important. When you get that email address, that's where you can start building that relationship even further. That's when you can start building your community with your with your your supporters. And so a lot of people just say, hey, I have the email um you know the email sign up on my website but i really don't ask for ask for it and it may be because like like myself i really didn't know why even asking for a thumb up was important until recently and i say recently i would say the last year and a half or so because i had no idea i thought people were just saying hey gives me a thumbs up so other people could know that you like it which is also important in marketing because people tend to what did the first tip say do what other people in their position have done so if you have a video with a lot of views or a lot of thumbs up a lot of people are going to click that over a view a video with maybe lesser views um, so it's really important that when you are looking at achieving your business goals that you take a step outside of your own personal experience you take a step outside of your friend's personal experience and you do go to a broader study just to get more information and see what's working for um, a larger group of people and see if it's going to work for you so I think that that is a good uh, tip as well. And then um, I think the last one that I'm going to go over before I end this video is use random reward schedules. Um, so you know those stamp cards that some restaurants and coffee shops give you that allow you to get a free drink on the 10th time you come? Actually, although those cards can be effective, they're not the most effective way of incentivizing customers to come back. Instead of having a fixed ratio reinforcement schedule where customers get rewarded every 10 time they come, you should have a variable reinforcement where customers get rewarded randomly. This draws on a concept called operant conditioning in psychology, where we learn to associate our behaviors with events. For example, associating going back to a restaurant with getting a free drink. Operant conditioning commonly involves rewarding a behavior to get more out of that behavior. And there is a video on YouTube that you can watch that B.F. Skinner created where um, it shows you how he did this um, experiment used with, a, with mice. And so um, it's really cool. If you have spare time, look at B.F. Skinner and read, some, read more about opera conditioning. I did a video that I'm going to post on my second channel, and it's a relationship type video. And I was explaining in that video how operant conditioning is one of the reasons why people stay in toxic relationships. Um, I don't really talk about relationships on this channel. But again, like I said, my second channel, Brittany's Place, the link is down below. That's where I'm going to be talking about that kind of stuff if you're interested. But that's one of the reasons that people stay in toxic relationships, because it's that you, you get conditioned to the variable um reward of someone 
coming back into your life. For example, let's say you have a relationship or you know someone in a relationship and they get treated like crap. This person leaves whenever they want. They come back whenever they want. You don't know when they're going to be on good terms or not. You don't know what's going to happen. And for some reason, this person, your friend or yourself, you're still opening the door. You're still answering the call. You're just hoping that this person comes back today, even though you know this person has done you crazy for the last 10 years, right? And a part of that is because your mind has been conditioned to this conditioning called operant conditioning, where you are... Um, thriving off of this reward, right? Like you, your reward is them coming back. And because you don't know when they're going to come back, it keeps you addicted to it. It keeps you conditioned to that relationship. And so that's the same in business. Um, so we're going to go over how does that apply to marketing? Um, so although humans and animals are very different, we are also very similar. Imagine if a restaurant didn't tell us when they're going to give us a free drink. We'd probably be going back as much as we could to maximize our chances of getting that free drink. Cereal brands and Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory take advantage of variable re reinforcement by putting golden tickets in some of their cereal boxes or candy bars, spurring us to want us to buy more for a shot to win. Perfect, perfect example. When I was younger, they used to have so many different like commercials talking about what you could win, showing the toys in the cereal boxes, and the Cracker Jack boxes and I would beg my parents to get certain cereal that I really didn't even like just because I wanted a chance to win the toy. I didn't know that I was being conditioned. I didn't know anything about operating conditioning. Just learned about that phrase while going to school for psychology. Didn't know anything about it, but I started learning more about operant conditioning. Again, look up BF Skinner if you're, if you're not familiar. Not, and a lot of stuff started to make sense. Like I said, the relationship um, example, I started looking at people that would come to me and talk to me about the relationships, like friends or even just people like associates that knew I was in school for psychology. And also even before I was in school for psychology, People has all have always naturally just come up to me and, and ask me certain things. And so I don't have the answers to everything, but I can tell you that learning more about that type of conditioning where you are given a reward on a variable scale, um, how addictive that can be is one tool that a lot of people use in business and also outside of business. So also taking that concept and thinking, well, what can I do to reinforce that into my business? So considering giving your customers maybe um, entering them into a drawing every month to, to get a free item or um, randomly, as I've seen this and I really like this technique, people will put like a Starbucks code um, on their Instagram for people that are following them on Instagram and they would do it randomly to get a free um, Starbucks drink from them. And so people will continue to follow that per page because they're like, I don't know when they're going to do this again, but I want to make sure that I'm in it. I want to make sure that I'm getting a free drink next time they do it. So it's really important to remember that keeping it not so tailored, like not having, I'm not saying being consistent doesn't work, but finding a way to be inconsistent in that way in your business is also going to help drive more sales and also keep more people engaged with what you're doing. I'm going to stop the video right here. I'm going to be coming back with a second video. So be sure to subscribe if you have not done so already. Um, also hit the thumbs up button. It lets me know that you like videos like this. And then it also helps push this video out to other algorithms. I'm going to be recording. Let me see how many more points we have. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, I think it's 11. So we have quite a bit more points to hit on. So make sure that your um, post notifications are on. Give the video a thumbs up. I know I said that a few times. I really mean it um, because I'm going to be doing another video and I want you all to be alerted when I do do it. So thanks so much for tuning in and I'll talk to you on the next video. Bye.